Hello, everyone. Uh, it is good to see so many familiar faces. Welcome to uh, this week's webinar Wednesday with the MSc program. Um, very excited today. We have Professor Leslie to church with us. And uh, by way of introduction, Leslie is a professor of communication studies here in the School of Communication. Um, she's also the chair of the communication studies department uh, here in the School of Communication. Um, uh, just uh, briefly here, Leslie has her bachelor's degree from the University of Miami, and she earned her PhD in organizational psychology from Florida International University. She's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, Association for Psychological Science and the Society of Industrial and Organizational Psychology. Um, she's published more than 75 journal articles, proceedings, chapters, and an edited volume. Um, relevant to today, Leslie has been studying um, teams and leadership in the military, science, healthcare, disaster response, online communities, and most recently in outer space, which is really fun to say. Um, what we're going to hear about today, I believe, comes from Leslie's work um, as a leader of the Atlas Research Lab, where she's currently working with NASA's Human Research Program. Um, and uh, I believe member of the Mission to Mars project to solve uh, difficult problems about teamwork. And again, these things are just fun to say on space explorer teams is not something that I get to talk about every day. So I'm really excited today, Leslie, um, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks so much for being with us. Wonderful. Thank you, Toby. Um, it is so great to see all of you. I see so many familiar faces and names. Um, we have two agenda items today. The first is that I want to carry you out of the problem space of your work world and invite you to think about the context of exploring other planets. Um, the second is I promise that I will share with you three insights that I hope are useful to you leading your team during a time of crisis. Um, away. Oh my gosh. Okay. The professor contractor wasn't kidding about the chats. Um, and so I promise there will be practical insights. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in recent months is how we can take this research that's being done on space teams who are in many ways facing conditions that we are facing right now, um, extreme and prolonged harsh conditions, limited mobility, um, bland diets, uh, <laughs> lack of social stimulation, extreme kind of isolation that's prolonged um, and a very real uh, risk of harm uh, coming to us from certain activities we may engage in. So with that, let's leave our context uh, and get off the planet for at least the next hour. Uh, so if we listen to Elon, humans are about to become interplanetary. So rather than imagining us living on earth in different countries, we can envision a next step for humanity, or humanity where we look a little more like a Star Wars movie, um, where there are colonies of people, scientists, um, and specialists who are living on other planets. Um, this is what is be this is the vision behind NASA's journey to Mars. And the interesting thing to me about the journey to Mars is that NASA is an engineering organization. And when they set out on a mission, they set up all of the risks that have to be mitigated. Risk of uh, people dying due to prolonged exposure to radiation, risk of uh, bone atrophy related to um, living in zero gravity, risk of the rocket ship blowing up halfway, risk of running out of this, risk of getting hit by an asteroid, right? So, there are all of these kind of things that stand in the way and very systematically they go through and scientists work on this one. So this is how I came into the picture. Um, when we started looking at a mission to Mars, it brought up a new risk, risk related to human collaboration. Um, more formally defined, the risk of performance and behavioral health decrements that are due to inadequate cooperation, coordination, communication within a team, um, by a show of hands, has anyone ever had a team experience that was dysfunctional and it caused them to lose sleep or experience anxiety? I'm seeing virtual and real hands, okay? So the good news is NASA has validated your life experience and identified an engineering risk 
that in fact, a mission to Mars could fail, not because of any of the uh, laws of physics which govern our ability to go to another planet, but because people don't get along in a team. Um, so that's what motivated this work. To see why this is a problem, uh, a mission to Mars is about 259 days. Um, it will take us an amount of time to get there. We want to have people on the surface for a period of time, and they'll have to come back. Now, this is the mission plan. So when we take off from Earth, we have to launch on a particular window based on where Earth and Mars are so that we can make this hum and transfer orbit. So we get into Earth's orbit, we make this minimal fuel burn transfer across to Mars orbit at exactly the right moment. So you can see how there's a time we have to launch and a time we have to land. This is the real mission table. So every 10 years, there are about five opportunities to launch, right? We can't just launch whenever we want. So most of you, did anyone watch the most recent Mars landing of our rover? Yes. Wonderful. So that rover launched in July um, last year, and it launched from Cape Canaveral. Very exciting uh, moment to see that, but that's how long it took for it to get to Mars. And so the real issue here is Mars is extremely far. Um, it, when we think about teams that we lead in our organizations, we have lots of ability to change things when they go wrong. Um, okay, this team is understaffed. We need to bring in some additional support resources. This team member isn't working out. We need to replace them. Um, we can't change the team once they leave, right? So distance places this very real need to get it right the first time. Um, in terms of communication delays, we can't even provide that much support. So depending on exactly where those planets are, it can be three or 22 minutes to get your message across. Now, we've all tried to have a text message conversation with someone who's not responding immediately. Even a lag of 30 seconds, right, can really kind of change the nature of how you interpret and understand what's being conveyed. Um, so this level of distance means that we're essentially launching a team with very little ability to support it from Earth or to send in reinforcements. Um, and so a question that we've been looking at that all of you have just been living in this experiment is what happens to teamwork under extended periods of isolation and confinement? Um, I think a lot of you have thoughts on this. So when we started exploring this question for NASA, this was pre-pandemic um, and we said, you know, we, what we really need is what the biologists have. When they want to study some organism, they have these little things called Petri dishes, which we've all used in science class, where you grow a sample, you watch what happens, you put it under a microscope. For this Petri dish, we would like to be able to manipulate people's isolation and sensory deprivation. Um, we also would like to make them do complicated tasks and some very boring, monotonous tasks, monitor them 24 seven, uh, no privacy, and give them unlimited surveys, <laughs> asking them to tell us about their psychological functioning. So you might remember uh, the psychologist, uh, Phil Zimbardo, who worked at Stanford and did the famous Stanford prison experiment. This might be uh, Zimbardo's dream. This is exactly what we are doing. So before all of planet Earth became an isolation experiment, space agencies all over the world had set up isolation chambers to be able to study what happens to human collaboration and cooperation when you put people in isolation chambers. Um, the one that I'm going to be sharing a lot of data and insights with you today is from one that NASA controls. This is down in Houston. So there's a big hangar which is uh, depicted here and there's this essentially what looks like a pop-up camper. Um, crews of four members who have a STEM degree are astronaut-like in many ways, um, go into this habitat for 45 days and they are completely locked in. They're following a mission protocol. Uh, they are headed out into space. They will have communication delays at certain periods of time, subject to sleep deprivation, um, minimal privacy while they're inside. Um, and it provides kind of an ideal place for us to study teamwork. 
We're not the only ones doing this. Uh, also included in the data I'll show you is a analog that we're using in Moscow. So the Russians have created what looks like a mini space station uh, with different sleeping quarters and modules where they can do experiments, a six person international crew. Um, the data that we have is from a four month mission. We are, as we speak, getting ready for the next crew uh, starting in September when it's possible for us to send Americans to Moscow safely. Uh, we will be studying a crew of six people who are going to go into this isolation chamber for eight months. Um, and there may be one crew member from Emirates. Um, there's likely uh, one European. So this is going to be truly a kind of international crew that is uh, locked away in isolation for eight months. Russia and American are not the only ones in the game. Japan has an isolation chamber where they do interesting things like um, observe astronauts making lots of these detailed origami figures. Um, the Chinese have a lunar palace. They do uh, fascinating experiments where people are growing plants without light and minimal water. Um, and the European Space Agency has what I consider to be the best analogs uh, off the coast of France. They have uh, a diving analog um, <laughs> off the French Riviera. In Spain, in the desert of Rio Tinto, they have a space analog. Um, this one here is the Rio Tinto analog in Spain. Um, and a, a number of their caves in Italy where they do these isolation experiments. So Europe uses its topography um, to do these team uh, experiments. Uh, Concordia, the caves in Sardinia, and I forgot the Canary Islands, um, another place where Europe is conducting these space analog experiments. Private foundations are doing this too. So the Mars Society uh, was one organization. They set up this camper out in the desert and put teams inside again to watch how they live together. Um, and there is one that many of you may have heard of it. It's on the side of a volcano in Hawaii. Um, it's called the High Seas Analog and a wealthy benefactor who is passionate about the space program funded it, developed it, donated it to the University of Hawaii and said, here, if this is going to help get us into outer space and you need this to do your science, uh, just think the physicists aren't the only ones asking for cool toys. Uh, with their particle accelerators, social scientists are asking for isolation chambers to lock teams away. So can we imagine leading a team when the members of the team are one, socially isolated from their friends and family, two, confined to a relatively small space, three, under conditions that make it hard to work, like you're deprived of sleep, you're distracted, you have potential health concerns, and you do this for an extended period of time without a break. Um, I used to talk about some of these isolation experiments before COVID, and it was hard to imagine that anyone could live and try to work in a team in this environment. Of course, now all of us are going, well, what have you learned that might actually help me? Because now this is my reality. Um, and I'll, before showing you some of those insights, I'll point out former cosmonaut Valerie Ruman said, all the conditions necessary for murder are met if you shut two men in a cabin measuring 18 by 20 and leave them together for two months. Um, so this is perhaps uh, foretelling the criticality of doing research on human teams in isolation. So three lessons from space explorer teams to our teams uh, back on Earth. The first one is that teams have a mission clock. When I talk to people about teams and I say like, what determines the dream team? What determines if the team, whether you're looking at sports or organizations, invariably people think about the mix of individuals. Like who did you put in the team? Are they expert? Do they have good interpersonal skills? Do they know how to do the basic requirements of their job, right? What about leadership? Do you have competent leadership in place? Um, does everyone understand the expectations? Is the team supported? Does it have resources? This is one of the factors our, re our research is showing matters that people often don't think about, which is that all of our teams are living in a clock, right? 
There's a clock that's determined by our job. And there's a clock that's determined by living in a pandemic, right? If we think back to what it was like when we first moved a team virtual, and we think about what it's like now, I bet you can see mark changes in how you've adjusted to it, the intensity of the energy that's there, um, how your group has had to adapt. So I wanna show you some findings that will put this into, I think, even sharper focus. So first of all, I'm gonna show you data from two kind of tasks. The first is called an execute task. Um, this is something that takes psychomotor coordination. It's a physical task. If you're playing soccer, that would be an execute task. If you are working together in a construction project, that's an execute task. Um, these are teams observed in isolation doing execute tasks. What's at the bottom is the mission day, how long they've been isolated. Each one of these lines is a different team, right? So what's the pattern that you see in the data? I'm gonna put you on the spot. Chad, what's the pattern? As, as they're together longer, their scores increase. Exactly, exactly. So the lines are separated, right? So in other words, if we look at day 12, some teams are better than other teams at the execute task, but as Chad notes correctly, pretty much they all go up, right? So if we look at the trend from day 12 to day 41 or day 30 for the teams that ended at 30 days, they're kind of getting better at that, right? So many of the things that an astronaut does involves kind of rote coordination. Execute tasks in our lives can look very different, but they might involve things like co-writing reports, combining data together, developing a branding campaign. These are things that become routine over as you learn your job better, right? The good news is, as the team is together longer, they do these things better. Um, but notice that the mission clock is leading to performance and learning. But I want to show you another kind of task. So, by the way, this is the kind of data that NASA loves. Leslie, this is great news, right? This is what we thought. You get the right people together. Let's figure out how to get one of these teams that's like up here, right? That they're starting good, they're gonna continue to improve. But then I say, not so fast. So now let's talk about another kind of work that teams do, which is innovating, okay? So now I'm giving a team a task where there's not a known correct solution, right? They have to generate a solution. They have to put information together in novel ways. The, my favorite creativity task is in the Apollo movie where um, Tom Hanks comes out and throws a list of objects on the table. And he's like, all right, figured out how to make an air filter with this stuff, right? That's a creative thinking task. There's no manual sitting on the side that he can say, here's the report of exactly NASA has a manual for how to do everything, how to fix this when it breaks, how to fix that, right? But here was a situation that, oh no, you know, <laughs> we don't have a replacement part for that um, on board the ship. So that's a creative thinking task. It turns out there's a pretty easy way to assess creative thinking performance of a team over time by giving them what's called an alternative uses task, right? Those of you who've taken my class have all done these. Um, they can be a lot of fun. So you have an object and you try to come up with some use for it other than what it's intended to be. And we have a database of all the teams who've done that in the past. So we can actually compute a score for how much your ideas on a given team are really different and rare compared to other teams. Here's what happens to um, space crews over time. Remember I told you the mission clock. This pattern does not look like the pattern of the execute tasks, right? It's a temporally driven pattern. So for those of you who are sports fans, right? Everyone talks about what happens in the third quarter, right? Or are we a second half team? Oh, we're a fourth quarter team, right? There's this kind of recognition that the clock of the game, how much time is left is affecting human performance, right? That's what we're seeing here with creative thinking in a totally different way. Look at day 30, right? So notice our teams, they kind of, they do show some improvement from when they're first put in the analog, 
as they are ingressed. After day 30 is the height of communication delay. They're totally isolated. They've been isolated for over a week. All their messages in and outside of the habitat are being delayed. They're totally sick of the black coffee that they're drinking out of little packets. Um, they're tired of having their blood drawn. They're tired of putting these sensors on and filling out all these boring surveys. Um, and we watch them and guess what? They live in a box and they can't think outside the box. Um, now notice right before they get out, their creative thinking comes back. Um, and so that's sort of an interesting observation, but think about your teams, right? So I said, you're living in a clock that's governed by your work, right? We can always think about what is the impact of proximity to a deadline, right? That matters. And that's a clock that you as a leader of a team can, can influence. I mean, a deadline's a deadline, but making sure the team is thinking about, aware of, right? Regulating in themselves so that they're, you don't have part of your team really on it in the first part of the mission clock, getting frustrated that other people aren't, right? So setting up, and you can't keep your team in first gear all the time, right? You've got to change the shifting and the pacing, right? So doing that, so the whole team is doing that together and recognizing when it's going to be harder to do that or easier to do that is part of what we get from this, right? That notice these lines are, some are higher, some are lower, right? So some of these teams are better than others, but all of them are being influenced by that clock. Um, and I think that's one of the things that has become really clear uh, to us leading in a pandemic that we don't always think about, right? Why did your team fail? Well, this person is a problem, right? Or we didn't have all the information we needed or our team wasn't adequately resourced uh, to do the work that we needed to do. All right, are we ready for the second one? Yes. Um, the second one is that teams have an uneven communication problem. Um, uneven communication is not a problem if you have a very smart person who's in charge of the team and they have all the information that they need to solve the problem. That's a pretty big if, right? So in fact, why do you even have a team if one person who's the boss knows everything, right? That sounds like an enormous waste of human talent to put them in a team and even to take other smart people and put them in this team where somebody else is in charge that has all the information and doesn't need you. That's not why we use teams, right? We put teams together because we have smart expert people who all have different information, different information because of the life experiences that they've had, the degrees, the formal training that they've had, the things that they've learned on prior teams or projects or situations that they've encountered in their jobs. That's the good stuff, right? That's why we have teams make decisions that are important and complicated because they have access to, the, to a wider range of perspectives. The pandemic task force, when that got announced, I mean, it's like a dream team, right? Here's the person that understands um, how to influence the public to uh, take a new, uh, a, an under-tested medical procedure. Here's the people who understand virology. Here are the people who understand um, public health implementation. Here are the people who know how to draw up these. They're, they're, they all have different backgrounds. It's easy to forget this though, when we're people, we don't come into the team conversation like wearing different colors. Well, I'm the red peg, you're the orange peg, right? We just come into the conversation and we develop these dynamics of how we talk to each other, which can be quite imbalanced. And this is something that we've seen in every one of these um, space explorer teams. So some of you have done uh, some of these tasks because we do them in class um, and in, in residence for HLP. Um, these are actually scientific tasks that we developed to be used with NASA. So they're all realistic situations that a crew could encounter. And what we do is we take all of the necessary information that would be required to reach a correct decision. We give them three options. So interstellar, which is one a lot of people have done um, in MSC, right? There's three potential planets that you could explore. 
One of them, it, you only have enough fuel to get to one of them. It's based loosely on the movie plot. Um, and so which planet are you gonna choose, right? Everyone is given information, some information that um, only they have. And then there's other information which is shared that's given to everyone in the team. But we distribute the information so that the information that's critical that you need to reach the right answer is in different people's head, right? So we actually create the case where you do need a team. You need a team of very smart people where no one's in charge and everyone knows something critical, right? So this is the formula for how we distribute the information. Not that important, but common information, everybody's got 12 things that they all know. And then unique information, there's three or four things that each person knows that nobody else knows. Now, keep that in mind as I show you this next graph. Here, what I've done is plotted the, dis, the evenness of communication across all the crews. This is this, these are the same crews that I showed you, the mission clock effect. So person number one is designated as the person who talks the most. I just arbitrarily call them one. Then I look at who talks the second most, I call them person two, person three, person four. Now remember, I showed you everyone gets the same amount of information, the same amount of unique information. The dotted line, is what I would see if they were having a fully democratic even discussion, right? Which is what their training tells them to do. Um, that's not what they're doing, right? And by the way, <laughs> this effect gets even more pronounced with every one person you add to where it looks like a complete drop to zero. So this is a four person team. It's not that hard to have a conversation with four people that's pretty even. If we tried to do it with everyone on Zoom right now, it would be, we couldn't do it, right? Because by the time we got through everyone having a speaking turn, um, it would be tomorrow. So it's a little harder, but here's four people. The first person is basically taking the airtime from the latter three and everyone's complicit. It's not just that the first person is obnoxious. It turns out that people's brains have this hard wiring where once somebody sort of talks, it's polite or normalized to be a little more quiet. So groups tend to develop this tendency where there's an unevenness in how much people are talking, right? That's a script that we've developed over an evolutionary timeline that helps us be efficient in certain like life-threatening hunter-gatherer situations. But it's not very good when you have four people, each of which has critical information. Right? Because now you're reducing the probability that you're going to discover that information. Okay, so here's another slide. Now I took the unevenness, right? So I looked at how disparate the first and the fourth person are in terms of how much they're talking. And I looked at, well, what happens this over time? Because maybe they break down that hierarchy tendency. No, it gets much worse, right? So on the bottom, what I'm showing you with the VARs is day six, day 14, day 20, and day 34, right? So applied to our Zoom meetings of four people, the tendency is the longer we're together, it gets more and more uneven. That script gets really ingrained, right? So again, these are teams that are together for 45 days that have this model of you're solving a complex problem, you're all maximally motivated, you're trying to impress and show that you could be an astronaut, right? So they're not being told to operate in a hierarchy. Um, and I, watching the videos of these teams, there's even times where you'll see one of them say, oh, this is that problem where we all have unique information. And then they go, the next thing they do is just say, okay, well, I think it's this, shall we go with that, right? wait a minute, <laughs> you recognize that you don't have all the information and you still push your solution through, right? So this is a very subtle communication tendency that we recognize in our groups that two things, one is the longer you're together, right? Becomes harder to get people who aren't talking, get comfortable not talking. People who are talking, get comfortable talking. The other thing, I don't have the data here to show you, but you add one person, 
Um, so we do this with the six person crew in Russia and one person does all the talking, right? We add, you make it an eight person team and the, the discrepancy or the unevenness gets even more pronounced, right? So recognizing that as teams get larger, you really have to intervene and not count on um, a conversation flowing and recognizing it's not that people who aren't contributing don't have something to say, they're actually being quite polite. Um, but as a leader, the quite polite may be nice, but it's not what the team needs to be successful, right? Um, so you have to draw out the unique perspectives. That's the second one. Um, and by the way, here's the data on reaching the correct um, decision, right? Which is directly related to this unevenness. Um, so have, you know, to their peril, right? The tasks are designed to require teamwork. If you don't hear from some people, you don't learn what they know that you need to make the right decision. Um, and this is another one just to kind of drive this home even more. What I've plotted here is how uneven the communication is and the quality of do they share all the unique information. In the four teams, the four times where we observed the most discrepancy, um, they shared almost no unique information, right? So people don't withhold the common information. So we've all been in that group meeting where somebody says, well, I really think A is the person that we should hire for this job. And B says, yeah, I agree. I think A is the right person. Or the first person says, well, I think, you know, candidate A has this just killer resume and they seem to know everybody in the company. And then everyone echoes that same thing, but nobody shares those unique things, right? Which are critical to share to make the right decision. Okay. So there's a third suggestion, which I think is really important uh, for us now, right? The first two, we could arguably, we can use them now, but we could also use them when it's not a pandemic. It goes like this. If you're not with the team that you love, then find a way to love the team that you're with. And what inspired us, NASA pushed us um, this was not the punchline of the research, but this is kind of what, we, this is what we found, was NASA said, you know, it's great that you wanna compose the team and look at people who are gonna be um, performing well together, but realize that once we launch, we can't change anybody. We can't add to the team, we can't substitute, make a replacement. And so they gave us this challenge, right, as team researchers to say, first, tell us who to put on the crew, but then we want you to also figure something out in case, right? Um, part of the in case is, well, we can't decide for Russia who they're gonna put in the crew. We can't tell the Europeans who they should put. We certainly can't tell the Chinese who they're gonna put in the crew, right? So we need a, a way to compose a team when we don't control the whole team. Right? This is kind of like the reality that we all live in in our jobs. We don't get to choose everybody all the time. Some of it is, well, this person was hired or this person was put on the team by the partner, right? So that's where this principle comes in. So these are relationships among the crew. So one of the things we did uh, for the first five years in this research is track. Every couple of days, we gave these little sociometric surveys that say, um, who are you enjoying working with? and they would respond and nominate team members. And we would say, who makes it difficult, right? And they would respond. And we would get these nice network pictures. Um, this is so appropriate for those of you who are in the core class right now on leveraging networks. So you get these nice little pictures, right? Which show you the social topology of the group, um, how they're getting along, how they're not doing. So these bottom ones are hindrance ties, right? So notice that at the beginning, everybody's pretty happy, right? They all kind of like each other. But if we look at the hindrance, there's this one person that two people don't seem to like, right? We go a couple days forward. It, the third person also doesn't like this person. And look, remarkable. Every couple of days, we're seeing the same kind of thing where this person is not, um, is not liked. So the question is, these networks, which are changing consistently, are affecting the well-being of that crew. So when I asked you guys that question, who's worked on a team and found it really distressing? And 
most people can think of that nightmare scenario, right? Um, that's what we want to avoid. So when NASA tells us, come up with something where you don't get to pick the people, but you can make things better along the way. We took this and we have a computer model where we take any combination of people. Remember, we don't get to pick the people, but we get to know everything we want to know about those people. So our computer model can tell us what these networks are going to look like, given about a four hour battery of psychological tests that we do pre-mission. So we've done this over the last five years. We've taken all the people that have gone in these analogs. We've given them this extensive battery of psychological tests that, me that measures literally everything that's been found to affect human cooperation in extreme harsh environments. A lot of it's data that was collected in the polar um, environments, uh, backpackers, mountain climbers, um, undersea explorers, military deployed personnel. So we take all this data, we measure it, and we calibrate this computer model that will generate from knowing these qualities of people, how they're gonna get along over time, right? Now, again, NASA's not letting us change the people. We just get to know what the weather's gonna be like in the team based on the model. So how can we use this to make things better? Um, here's a little video that shows you the model in action. Again, this took about five years to develop. Um, and it does a very good job um, of being able to predict positive and negative interpersonal relationships among the crew over time. So now we said, okay, one way <laughs> that we could take the model, know what's going to happen, but like change things is to recognize that in teams, not everybody works together on everything all the time, right? If you've watched the Martian or the Netflix show away, you know that there's like certain people. If you've watched the mentalist detective team, right? There's like pairs who are often teamed up and work closely together. So we thought, aha, uh -huh. is this a strategy that we could use to repair the team? And I'm using that pun um, because that's what we call it, right? So you're repairing the quality of relationships in the team and you're doing it by repairing who works with who. So we run this model at the beginning of the mission and we find out, we let our little computer simulation play. So we're like, okay, if we identify, we have a task analysis, we know what work is tightly coupled and what work can be done more separated. And we say, if we pair these combinations of people up, how many happy days is the crew gonna have and how many tense, difficult days is the crew gonna have? Well, now here's the really fun part because NASA did let us manipulate that. So we said, we want to divide every mission into four parts where they get the, we want to put the best winning combinations of people together, the worst, then we want to switch it to the best. And then we want to do the worst. And then for half the teams, we want to start with the worst, best, worst, best, right? So basically we said, let us for every single crew come up with these winning pairs and let us put the team in what we think is gonna produce the most happiness. And then let us also put them in the most unrest. And it turns out that's exactly what happened, right? And then we measured these networks along the way. So the goal is to by changing who works with who on the most interdependent work, make the crew get along better, right? So an interesting question of this is, do you put the people who are gonna get along the best together or do you put the most conflict people together? And it turns out this depends if you're an engineer at NASA and you want a high functioning crew or if you're a Hollywood director trying to make a Netflix show. If you're the latter and you wanna make a show like Away that's really great, you wanna take the female American and the Russian former cosmonaut who don't see anything the same way and put them together and the show has this explosive plot. That is not what you want to do on a team, right? <laughs> that you want to be high performing. So based on our model and the, we ran this experiment validating these predictions, actually making these subtle tweaks where you identify 
the people who have to work the most closely and put the people who are going to have the easiest, most natural time getting along doing that, that not only makes those people get along better, it makes the whole crew work better and have fewer of these adversarial ties, right? So that's something interesting that, that may not have been intuitive or it may be intuitive, right? That one thing, one simple thing we can do is re we can't change who's on our teams, but we can change who interfaces. If you're gonna have co-leads of a joint initiative, pick people who get along the best. Not necessarily, oh, they have the most experience, right? The, these critical places where you have lots and lots of interdependence, people have to talk, they have to agree on things, they have to meet frequently, um, make that easy to do, right? Find your, your combination of people who really gel. All right, so um, hopefully I've, I've gotten you a little bit out of your context into another world. Um, and these are three things I think we can use. So one is recognize the clock, right? Think about your work in, and your leading of a team in terms of there's a mission clock here, right? It might not be in football where it's like on the screen at all times, right? Um, or on the field if you're watching it in person, but all of our organizations, our teams have these clocks, make them explicit. Um, the second one is intervene in your team so that the communication is uneven, right? view it as a treasure hunt. The person who's not talking has the treasure in their mind that we're all, right? They're not, they're not the person who's deviant, who's not cooperating. They're the person who's being polite, right? So that framing of I'm searching for what I haven't thought of um, can give your team access to unique and valuable information. And the last one is when everything else fair, fails, um, consider repairings, right? So consider ways you don't have to change the whole team. I mean, I've heard so many times people say like, I can't work with this person. If this person is on the team, you know, I'm quitting. Um, before it gets to that point, right? When you notice those frictions, those are opportunities where just a straight, slight restructure in how people are communicating can change those things. Um, of course, we have maximum ability to do this with NASA because we know every 15 minutes what work people are doing and there's a number which reflects how interdependent. But I think most of us know um, in our jobs, we may not have the NASA playbook, but uh, we generally know where the, the close connection points are. All right, so I'm going to stop talking and invite uh, any questions that you have. Um, Let's see, and I'm gonna put up a slide here and then we're gonna to go to Kat first with a thank you. This was a huge team that collects all of this data in analogs and designs these computer models. Um, Nashir Contractor um, Slab built the crew composition model. So any technical questions, feel free to ask them on Saturday. Um, all right, Kat, question. Yeah, so thinking about isolation, I think one of the, one of the sentiments that I've heard throughout the pandemic that has really resonated is that we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. So thinking about COVID isolation and everybody being isolated to their homes, you know, the NASA experiments are great because you've got the same kind of shipping canister where everybody's in all together, but individual circumstances vary greatly during this time. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on teamwork during those circumstances. Yeah, that's a huge one. Um, by the way, I just want to share with you one of the interesting things about this pandemic, and I'll have to share this at a future session, is that we collected this data. Um, the MSC students, you guys do these tasks, right? And it was kind of a natural experiment because MSC students from past uh, quarters have done these tasks when we did them in person. And then MSC students have now been doing them where everyone's in different places. Um, and we actually find the best performance, like the, the right answer is the most frequent among the teams that are isolated and confined and together. Then different from that and a little worse is the teams who are in person. And the worst in terms of getting sharing unique information. And by the way, this is not just MSC, this is also undergraduates doing this, are teams who are isolated where everyone's in different situations, right? So, um, and I have a, I think Valerie was in the fall, was a TA, 
she's been analyzing that data. So I'll definitely um, have her share some of that at one of our future sessions. But I think Kat, that's just to say that that's very real. Um, and that not it, it's, you know, you hear a lot of attention to the burnout and to the kind of human side of rec the importance of recognizing that people are, are experiencing this very differently. And so what might be okay uh, to impose on people who are, it's not, you know, my boat's pretty plush to people who their boat is for little kids under the age of five, you know, in the background um, is, is kind of different. But I think recognizing too that um, providing some of that support is how to keep members who are disproportionately infected, affected by the pandemic involved and engaged in decisions, right? Meeting at times that work for them. I mean, you know, the fact that we're seeing even between these classes, whether we do it in Zoom or all in person, a drop off in the sharing of unique information, um, you know, that's, that's concerning, right? It means this kind of Zoom environment is further uh, enhancing that unevenness effect. Um, and, and I think, Kat, the things you're talking about with the different storms or the same storm at the different boats um, is exacerbating that even further. Let's see. Looks like Jacob has a question. Hey, Leslie, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I got a quick question for you. This was great, really interesting to hear. Um, one of the questions that I have is what recommendations would you make for teams to do beforehand to set themselves up for success when they're actually navigating some of these different things? Um, teams is like space teams or our teams? Teams in general. I mean, if you think about this from a space perspective, my understanding is that they're meeting like the first day and that's their, their very beginning. For other teams where they may have had the opportunity to meet before, are there any conversations that they should have or pre-work that they should do to help set the teams up for success when they're going to be working on long-term projects together? Yeah, I think the more scaffolding and framing that you give, I mean, there's been a lot of research on this and it'll look at things like team contracts or um, pre-briefings, conversations that are structured and spell out a lot of these things that we're talking about, the, the roles that need to interface, how often, what are expectations regarding meetings, um, having structured conversations about contributions, like unique value that people bring to the team. That's something that people often skip over in our attempt to um, find common ground. Um, one of the things teams will do is talk about the experience they all have in common. Oh yeah, we all did this, right? But sharing what you've done that's really different from everybody else could be a key to leveraging your perspective on some problem. So I think the more, and, and even things like mission clock, right? The further in advance, nobody wants to find out that the mission clock is running to zero tomorrow, right? Or today. The more that people have the same schema about what the clock is and where we are in it and how we're gonna regulate around that can help people to be, okay, I have some flex time right now, but in two weeks, it's all hands on deck, right? So setting those schema in place before to the extent possible, or at least up, you know, what I found in the pandemic is teams have to update that a lot, right? Because things are constantly, um, things are constantly changing and there's new information. That's a great question. Yeah, did you do anything with the teams beforehand or was the first time that they met um, at like day one of, of isolation? So we did train them. They had approximately, the NEK had three months in Russia of pre-training and the NASA teams had a month of pre-training. Um, every one of those teams, I personally flew to Houston, um, it, you know, often with graduate students, we tra trained them on the tasks and we trained them on the expert process, right? So we collected baseline data, but we were also doing um, was trying to, to reinforce, you know, these are complex problems. Everyone has valuable information. Um, so we weren't trying to be too kind of heavy handed, but we wanted them to be, um, we did not want poor performance to be the result of not understanding the task, right? So the point was to have them fully trained up so that the day they ingressed into the habitat, um, they had kind of some of that basic structure in place. 
Chad has a question. Hello, Leslie. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. So I have a question that I'm encountering working with some clients right now, and this is about the delivery of not necessarily good news right now in this climate and also not really having an awareness of contingencies if things go sideways. It seems like a lot of people are just focused on getting back to normal or whatever, but they're not thinking like if the next shoe drops. Um, yeah. Like an example, like the vaccines end up not working or something else happens unanticipated and they're just not looking in that direction. I'm curious, are you, have you seen something like that or in that kind of situation, what would you advise? Yeah, I, and I think, Chad, to put it in the frame that we've been talking about, I think an interesting way that I think about that is what happens when you think the clock ends at 269 days and you're working on that clock. And what you're saying is the leader, you recognize it might be a 400 day clock, right? And the team is like, no, 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 we're perfectly positioned. To, this is all the resilience we have is day 269. Um, but you're saying, no, we might have to take the ship around for another lap around the galaxy. Um, and I think, you know, communicating that clearly, I, I don't envy the position. Um, I can say that personally, I feel it, at, you know, as the department chair, like people are ready for the mission clock to end. Um, and so I think that there, there has to be some certainty that you create in the midst of uncertainty. Right, which is like when you're adjusting the plan, not just like we may never be able to, or it might be another year, who knows. It's helpful to say like our optimistic is the end date of our mission is August, um, but an even more absolute is December, right? Even if that's some, but the more you can do to make it clear so that people have something that reduce, because what's really uncomfortable to people is uncertainty. Right, where it's, and we're living in such an uncertain environment right now. I mean, yesterday, Johnson & Johnson vaccine gets put on hold. Well, you know, <laughs> there goes the plan for Europe, you know? Um, and so, you know, this, we're kind of living in this information uncertainty environment. So even if it's somewhat artificial and then saying what the uncertainty around it is, right? But give it a, like, it's not just an indefinite change. It's like, we're hoping it will be this. If not, it will be, you know, September. Um, you know, so that at, to the extent that you can, I know it's hard to be realistic, right? We're all kind of trying to predict the unpredictable. Um, but the 1918 pandemic did end. <laughs> I don't know if that's comforting. Every plague in human history has ended. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions, Bob? Oh, wait, you're on mute. Oh, no, Bob. Okay, Leslie, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating. I really appreciate it. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, you talked in the beginning about um, how we've now all come into this time of COVID, and that's that shown a lot of things to you that you might have already been, you know, looking at isolation. Were there any specific lessons that you've learned in the time of COVID and the 13 months the world has been on lockdown that kind of changed the research direction or m messed it up in some way or taught you more? I, are there any glaring things that sort of stick out that you've learned that you've had to incorporate into your research? Ooh, really interesting question. Um, you know, I think it's related to what Chad was just raising. You know, I think one of the things that be, has become clear to us is that in some ways, a lot of our isolation experiments have been in this really sterile environment, right? The mission will end on day 45. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what happens, like it would be nice if we could do the experiment where um, day 45 comes and sorry, um, we're not able to end the mission. We're going to have to extend for two weeks. And so, um, you know, some of these sources of unpredictability, there are so many things um, that our teams are, are experiencing right now that are related to this unpredictability um, that make it really hard. You know, the core of teamwork is regulation, 
right? It's getting everybody to think in ways that are compatible, to have a shared understanding of the problem, resources, emotion regulation, we're all motivated at the right time. Um, you know, and so much of that regulation depends on having some boundaries. Um, and so one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about for this eight month experiment is how we can relax some of that. So um, we're gonna have some food resupplies that don't show up. We're gonna have a power outage. Um, you know, we're trying to think of what, <laughs> fortunately we're not governing at Northwestern the human subjects, the Russians are doing this. We're just um, suggesting potential disruptions. But I think that is one of the things that's really come in to focus for us um, is the importance of the unpredict of introducing unpredictability and then looking at how teams can effectively manage that. It's kind of like crisis communications where you do an example uh, simulation and then you throw in injects to disrupt it. Ooh, I love it, injects. That's a cool way to describe it. Other questions? I'm cognizant we're getting-, getting <laughs> No, yeah, I think this has been so great, Leslie. Thanks so much. Um, uh, it's, it's clear that it's a fascinating topic to everybody um, and being able to so easily draw the parallels between space exploration and you know, what is happening in all of our, our daily lives is uh, certainly appreciated and, and um, really brings it home for everybody. So thank you um, to Leslie for your time and uh, really terrific insights and sharing your research with us today. Thank you to everybody else for joining. Um, I appreciate all of the insightful questions and engagement, and uh, we'll let you all um, get along with your day. We um, are still putting together a panel for the next webinar, which is in two weeks, so I don't want to tip my hand, but keep an eye on your email um, for the uh, uh, next Wednesday webinar, and we'll hope to see everybody in a couple of weeks. But thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. Bye, everybody. See you, you soon so in person. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Toby. Bye.